<clears throat> Hello everybody, thank you for watching this, and uh, you know what, I'm just going to get right into it. You guys know the drill by now, I've got a lot of crazy shit to talk about today, so let's just get right into it and not waste any time. Okay, the first one is a VHS tape of the update, and this is a recommendation of my good friend Bob that we hang out with at the conventions every year. He has been telling me about this movie for one to two years now. He's been to every time we're on the phone and we're chatting. He's always telling me, oh, you got to see One More Saturday Night. One More Saturday Night. It's one of my favorite movies. And his previous recommendations of Midnight Madness and Up the Creek were both fantastic. Love both of them. And uh, this, there does exist an HD transfer of this film, but unfortunately... As far as home movie releases go, it never saw the light of day past VHS. So if you watch YouTube, there's an HD rip of this on there, but for me, I got the VHS of One More Saturday Night, uh, put together by Al Franken and Tom Davis of Saturday Night Live fame. It's a pretty fun one. I like it. I would not rank this the same as Up the Creek and Midnight Madness. Those are both fantastic 80s movies. But it's a fun ensemble piece comedy where, plot-wise, it's very loose. It's just different groups of people on this Saturday night, and you're just kind of following their misadventures. It cuts back and forth between everyone throughout the course of the night, and hijinks ensue. 80s fun, great soundtrack, you know. The characters are all pretty archetypal, but still fun. It kept me engaged. It's entertaining all the way through. Very catchy theme song. I like this one, One More Saturday Night. I wish there was a little bit more meat to the ending, although there is a good chase scene that's pretty fun. The way the stories wrap up feels a little too friendly. But outside of that, very fun 80s comedy. I appreciate the recommendation from Bob. Now this one was actually kind of hard to come by over the summer uh, because, as you know, the Field of Dreams game took place this year. I watched it live as it happened. I even had some friends who physically went to the Field of Dreams game in Iowa. I still do not know how those individuals got their tickets. If they are watching this, they could tell me. But when that game was going on, obviously it was very hard to get a copy of the film. And I really got in the mood to want to watch that when the hype over the game was getting real, and especially when I actually watched it and Kevin Costner was there. And uh, so finally got a Blu-ray of Field of Dreams. I when it comes to sports, baseball is pretty much my favorite. It's baseball and hockey are the two that I follow, or the two I like, you know. Chicago Blackhawks, yo. And uh, I'm not really a White Sox versus Cubs guy. Like, I'm... I like both of them. I know that's kind of the cheap answer coming from Chicago, but I watched the World Series in 2016 when the Cubs won, and I was happy. So, hey, you know, that's how my baseball fandom goes. I don't think this needs too much introduction. You know, it's very dramatic. It's a very heartwarming, feel-good story. It's a drama, but it's an, uplift, an uplifting one. Kevin Costner does great. You know, I think I showed Bull Durham in the last update, or maybe the update before that, and that's another good, very, that's the R-rated comedy baseball movie he did, whereas this is the very whimsical, fanciful one. Uh, he does not say, uh, you couldn't hit water if you fell out of a fucking boat in this one. <laughs> so, James Earl Jones, you know, everyone does great in this. Ray Liotta as Shoeless Joe. don't think that one needs much introduction. Now this one I've got a very funny uh, story with. Uh, if you follow my channel you'll see I was actually in Iceland last month and it was a six hour flight to Iceland from Chicago here and the plane, Iceland Air, had tons of free movies you could watch there on the screens on the back of the seats. So on the way there I watched two movies and then some TV shows but the first movie I watched was Game Night with Jason Bateman. I never saw it before, but, you know, on the plane to Iceland, I'm sitting there watching it. It was a pretty fun time. I really enjoyed it. And then, that was on a Thursday. And then we got to Iceland. Saturday night, my cousin Jason, who I went with, we get back to the hotel room. He turns on the TV, and Game Night was on the TV when he turned it on. We're like, are you, are you shitting me? How does that and then we're on the plane ride coming home, 
the next day, and I had the middle seat on the plane, the guy in front of me to the right, I had a perfect view of his seat, he was watching game night. And then when I got home, I went and saw No Time to Die in the theater. And that movie has two people from Game Night. So there's a period of October where this movie was stalking me everywhere. It was just showing up. It's a lot of fun, though. It's a good comedy that blends comedy with thriller with a little bit of action in there. The action-heavy scene, like the egg chase is amazing. There's some funny car chase moments. There's a bullet-in-the-arm moment that's kind of queasy. And uh, the character of Gary makes this. He's the best character. I love Gary. So, I, yeah, because I had... And, so not only, and the, the score, too, it's like this 80s synth, like, moody score with all this board game in, imagery. I'm surprised it's never got a sequel yet, you know. The movie did great at the box office. It was very well received critically. But then again, you know, maybe it's good being left as a one-off movie so they don't fuck it up. And it's funny just because this is like a souvenir of my Iceland trip. Now, when I watch this movie, I just think about my Iceland vacation because it popped up three times that weekend. That movie is random as that. I've got four from Vinegar Syndrome here, and this first one is one of their partner labels, the Terror Vision. And this was an interesting one. I knew I had to see this just to see what it was. It's from 2013, although most will make you believe it's 1987. The WNUF Halloween Special, which is kind of a found footage-ish storyline. It's this thing that's made, it's supposed to be like a recorded off the TV live television broadcast from 1987. And you could tell like the guy hosting the paranormal investigation reminded me a lot of a Geraldo Rivera type guy, so I think that's what they were going for. This one is kind of a mixed bag. You know, the VHS is cool, but I, I like this cover better. Uh, so, this one's a mixed bag because this is the most realistic adaptation of making a false 80s artifact that I have ever seen. The way it's shot, the way all of the commercials are shot and edited, the static, the fuzz, the tracking. It, it, this is probably the most authentic not 80s posing as an 80s thing that I have ever seen. So the director, the crew, uh, Chris Lamartina, uh, did awesome in that regard. But the problem is it's so realistic that it's completely, except until you get to the very end where it gets, you know, horror and slashery at the very end, and even that ending feels kind of underwhelming. But the, the big fatal flaw is that it's so realistic, like the commercials just feel like typical 80s commercials. Like they're not really silly, they're not really heightened, they're not really parody, which I get they were trying to go as authentic as they could, and for that they succeeded, but it also kind of takes away some of the enjoyment factor of the actual special. So... It's mixed. If you just if you're just a huge '80s TV fan and you just want to see something that fits that mold, it's a very fascinating watch. But if you're watching it for like a storyline and as like a pseudo movie, it does well. I think there's too many commercials. There's too many commercial breaks that they did not. You, you start watching this paranormal investigation they're doing in this house. It keeps going to commercial and it really screws up the momentum. The ending is pretty lame and underwhelming. It, it goes into typical found footage type levels, and it so it's mixed. So I, I'm gonna say proceed with caution on that one. Same vinegar syndrome. If, if they see this, they're gonna they're gonna want my head on a stake for saying this. This is like their big anticipated release of New York Ninja. Which, long story short with this one, it's a film that was filmed in 1984, but it was abandoned as soon as filming was finished. Thus, the footage existed, but no audio existed. So Vinegar Syndrome, with their new Vinegar Syndrome Pictures line 01, uh, sought to... Sought to... They got the film somehow, so they hired a bunch of voice actors and a band to redub recompose and just re-synchronize the entire thing. 
and because it's the kickoff of their partner layer, they this huge, durable, beautiful artwork, you know, a very durable box. I love New York Ninja. Making of book that's actually pretty thick. And then <laughs> the Blu-ray of it. It's a fascinating story, it's an interesting story, but this movie is not deserving of this whole package. This was terrible. It's, it's funny in places. Like, you could watch this for some laughs, and they did the best they could. I, I do say that, and the work and the effort that they put into restoring this long-lost film is commendable. And they did a really nice job. And it is funny. Like, some of the bad dubbing and the lines, like, you will laugh at portions of this. And they've got people like Michael Berryman, Don the Dragon Wilson, Linnea Quigley, Cynthia Rothrock. The dubbing is absolutely atrocious. It never matches what's on the screen. It sounds out of place. The dubbing is absolutely awful, and it takes you out of the film right away. The music, which is composed by a band called Voyager, with a three, never heard of that band before, they're the stars of the show because the music they composed for this was 100% perfect. Like right out of a 1984 action movie without sounding like that overrated 80s Stranger Things synth nostalgia. They made it sound like an actual score. The movie, it's hilarious if you're in for a Miami Connection type bad movie. Knock yourself out with this, but it, it's not good. <laughs> it's, I, I paid a lot of money for this, you know, to directly from them as a pre-order, so it's the artwork on that is beautiful, it's just that the movie, it's, it's not the unreleased hidden gem that you would be led to believe. But, and again, they do some of the best packaging ever, because then we got Ticks, which I've been wanting to see this for a long time. I actually bought a bootleg of this like 10, 11 years ago, and I couldn't get to watch it because the bootleg DVD had no sound. Fitting, huh? But no, it had no sound, so I watched like two minutes. I'm like, well, I can't watch this. There's no audio. And then Olive Films put it out on DVD and Blu-ray that went out of print. It goes for like 200 bucks. So finally, I was happy to see Vinegar Syndrome putting out this 4K. You know, I do not have a 4K, a 4K player. I just use the regular Blu-ray on this. And again, it's like a slip cover within a slip cover, which is a bit excessive. But, you know, for seeing little pint-sized Seth Green, Alfonso Ribeiro, and, you know, the gang, it's a very fun 90s monster movie. The effects are a lot of fun. It goes back and forth between, you know, the stop-motion ticks running around. But then, when you get into the blood and gore effects, this movie has some really well-done effects. Especially if you just do not like insects, if, if you get really giddy at creepy crawlies and... You know, there's lots of points in here where you, you see, like, the larva eggs and sacks that they come from. If you don't like that kind of stuff, this movie's going to be a detriment to you. And, uh, you know, I, I have to put this out there as a disclosure. If you're the type of person you don't like seeing bad things happen to dogs in movies, not for you. But early 90s monster movie. It's a lot of fun. It, it lives up to the hype that I've heard. And the last Vinegar Syndrome one, I never heard of this before in a day in my life, but the, with a cast like Craig Sheffer, Anthony Michael Hall, Eric Roberts, really piqued my interest. And it's this mid-90s movie called The Grave. Now, I would not label this a horror movie. I, I read a lot of people on it considering this a very scary movie. They say this movie creeped them the hell out. I honestly don't get why. There's really nothing scary or creepy. It's... it's it's a treasure hunt, caper, thriller. Some of the nighttime footage in the graveyard, and, you know, it, it's filmed very moody. It, it's very well done. It's a complete southern fried adventure. But it's intriguing enough, you know. It, this is the type of movie, it literally feels like the kind of movie some friends would be telling around a campfire. It's got that very are you afraid of the dark type sensibility to it where I could easily see this as a story, you know, being inputted somewhere else. And it's fitting because the movie is structured that way where someone is telling it as a story that kind of bookends and closes the movie. Anthony Michael Hall does great in an almost unrecognizable role. I like Craig Sheffer, so... Yeah, I really like this one. I didn't. It's the kind of it keeps you guessing where it's going. It's you know there's a lot of deception happening and these people, their relationships, how they how they each know one another and how they 
fuck each other over. Very underrated one. I, I really enjoyed my time watching The Grave. Just like with this one, I had a, a friend saw this in theaters, apparently. I didn't even know this got a theatrical release. You know, I'm a big sucker for these moody haunted house type movies, and I got this at Target. The Night House. And uh, very well done. It's, it's almost... <laughs> The story becomes a little too complicated by the end because you have this thing where it deals with like these alternate worlds. You don't know what's in her head, what's not, and the, the stuff she's dealing with. The movie is suspenseful as hell. It's eerie, and again, it keeps you guessing what is happening the entire way through. Uh, Rebecca Hall, the lead woman, is amazing. Like She has some emotional breakdown scenes that she sells completely. And I love that this movie did not take any of the typical story directions a movie like this would take. It's, it's very similar, in a way, to a Kevin Bacon movie that came out last year called You Should Have Left, which I think I'm the only person on the face of the planet. I actually like that movie. So I would say this is, this is definitely a much more polished, complex version of it. The ending gets a little too complicated. I had to go on YouTube and watch some ending explain videos to make sure I fully got it, but you know, it's moody, it's creepy, it's really well done. I recommend it. It's not a slasher or anything like that. You have to be into it for a story-driven slow ride, but it's good. Malibu Express from the Andy Sedaris Collection. I love Hard Ticket to Hawaii, and this is pretty much in this where this is just complete excess. It's so stupid. Like, one of the first things you see is a race car coming down, and then a blonde babe gets out, and then she takes her top off. And then lots of boobage in this one, lots of showers, and just lots of really, really stupid action scenes with 80s excess to the core. I'll say I probably like Hard Ticket to Hawaii a little bit more than this one. This one was almost so cartoonish that it was just like, what? But if you like Hard Ticket to Hawaii, if you're familiar with the Andy Sedaris movies, you know what you're getting with Malibu Express. Try not to dwell on too many of these. These videos are usually too long. Now, the video I uploaded before this was an unboxing video of a bunch of Blue Man Group stuff I ordered. And I've always been a lifelong fan of the Blue Man Group. For more information, you can watch that one. But uh, before my unboxing video, I actually got this on eBay. This bootleg DVD. Actually, I don't know if it's a bootleg, but it's a promo DVD of some sort. I've never seen this before. It came in this jewel case. The Blue Man Group 20th Anniversary Reunion Show from 2011, where the original three founders of Blue Man Group uh, Chris Wink, Phil Stanton, Matt Goldman got together and did a show for one last time as the Blue Man at the Astor Place Theater in New York. I don't know, I'm a, if I had to guess, I would guess this was a DVD that was given to everyone who attended that show. And it's a typical Blue Man show, there's nothing too special about it, but you know, it's very, it's a two camera setup. If you know anything about the Blue Man Group, you know it's a fun show, and it was cool watching this, especially that it was the original three guys. I've never seen that pop up online before or since, so where that's available, I don't know. Same with this. This is a promo DVD that came with the unboxing package I did. It's a 45-minute long documentary called Creating Blue Man Group. And so it's got the, that documentary, which is really fun, and then you have a bunch of bonus on here, like Blue Man Group collaborating with the Kodo Drummers. The best is you have a Funny or Die sketch on here that I had never seen before that involves the Blue Man Group working at a fast food restaurant. That was hilarious. And then there's a making of that on here, too. Uh, Blue Man Group and DJ Tiesto collaboration. Uh, Conta Conmigo music video. So... Again, as a lifelong Blue Man Group fan, finding just these random promo DVDs that I've never seen before with all that random content, it's just really cool. Then the last update, I show Cube. Well, in this update, I can complete the pattern by showing Cube 2, Hyper Cube, and Cube 0, which is the prequel. Starting off with this one, this is a very weird movie, whereas the first movie is very much a saw, you know, escape room, 
body horror trap horror thriller where it relied on gore and the suspense but at the same time it was very mathematical and it was very heavy on the characters interactions with one another and how they had to use logic to escape the situations this throws all of that out the window there are no traps it does not rely on the characters working together it this the set design is very different this is 100 percent an early 2000s sci-fi movie where this is very much less it's not at all about traps or the horror this is 100 percent about the munip the manipulation of time and space where this is a four dimension tesseract hypercube that exists in four dimensions that's constantly shifting reality so you have all these characters that throughout the course of it are running into themselves from parallel universes certain rooms of the cube the gravity's reverse time moves really fast and some time it's and even the music score is very techno psychedelic type you arguably have the most potential with this one and parts of that i do really like but then again some of this just did not work at all <laughs> like it, it, they tried to bite off way more than they could choose with that premise which feels like it should be in like a doctor who type thing i didn't completely hate it I, I could say there's things i like about all three of the cube movies this one like i said for that crazy sci-fi non-horror plot of it, the manipulation of time and space it, they, they bit off more they, than they could chew with it and they just it's clear they <laughs> by the end of the movie they didn't know where they wanted to go with it there's aspects of it i do like it is kind of interesting the ideas and some of the execution with it the very ending is a letdown but it's not terrible but it, it's probably my bottom of the three cube movies and i actually am surprised how much i like this one cube zero because i heard a lot of terrible things about it you know it's a prequel to the original so if you know, you could choose to ignore this one if you don't want to find out a little bit more about the lore of the cube, but I was still entertained by it. I liked how it was like a rescue storyline, and the, the only thing, there's some real tonal whiplash with this. As soon as you meet the main villain of this movie, it's this character named Jax, who this long hair, this top hat, and he's got like a bionic eye. He acts like he's in a cartoon. Like, he's completely chewing the scenery and making a mockery of this movie. It is so out of place and random and ridiculous, I actually kind of loved it. <laughs> like, I really got into it. And, you know, this one, it, it's got a cool ending that ties it in through revealing certain aspects of the first movie. But yeah, I, I know a lot of people hate this one, but I actually really liked it. It's definitely a, a more coherent better structured movie than hypercube which tried to introduce and and one other thing too this one arguably has the best gore effects out of the entire thing this one a there's not a single drop of blood in the entire movie and the cg is some of the worst you will ever see we're talking like a playstation one game with that but I can tell you things I liked about all three of the cute. One is still the best. Then this one was pretty solid. This one's okay, but it needed a lot of touch-up work. It's very artsy, too. Cube Hypercube. Now this. I need to be brief on this because I could do a whole video just talking about this. I don't know where this movie has been hiding my entire life. but So we've got Judge and Jury. Have you ever heard of this? Because I never did, and not a single person I know has ever heard of this, starring David Keith, Martin Cove, and Thomas Ian Nichols. You know, a shocker, the chair, the first power, the horror show, destroyer, prison, fallen, killer gets executed and comes back as a supernatural being for revenge. That is this movie right here. But let me tell you, this has to be the most bonkers, batshit thing I have ever witnessed in my life. I have never laughed so hard at a movie in my life. Because the killer comes back, he's coming around as Elvis Presley. He's a clown for no reason. He's a woman. There's a scene where he becomes a French chef with a big twirly mustache. He's talking in an accent. Martin Cove is playing the whole thing dead serious. He hooks up with a goofy black sidekick at one point, and 
the, the, the dialogue. Guys, if you're a fan of, and again, no one I know, I've looked up reviews of this, no one has reviewed this thing, this is completely unknown. And if you love, like, Red Letter Media, Best of the Worst, which not even they have covered this, like, I, I, I seriously think I willed this movie into existence, because I don't know a single person who knows this. If you love laughing at hilariously bad but entertaining movies, this thing is a gold mine. I'm tempted to say this might be one of the most entertaining bad movies I have ever seen in my life. And you know I love a lot with the stuff I show in these updates. So yeah, this was absolutely terrible, and I loved every second of it. One of the funniest things I've ever watched. Like, I love this thing. <laughs> it's, you have to love bad movies to appreciate it. Just like with something like this, slacks. Uh, there's aspects of, this is a short movie, this is what, 70 minutes? Yeah, like 70 minutes. It's ridiculously short. There's a lot of laughter to be had with this. There's a lot of really goofy imagery, silly stock characters that you just want to see die. There's, but this movie tries to throw in like, ten different subliminal messages about child labor and slave labor and Black Friday shopping and retail and consumerism. You're trying to throw in all these morals in something that's 70 minutes long. So right then and there, the script for this is an absolute mess. There's a really random love of Bollywood thrown in. And yeah, this thing is weird. And that, I mean, a movie about killer genes, I, I guess you get what you expect out of that. Like I said, it, it has a really dumb ending. The, they tried to juggle five different subliminal messages about those different topics into a 70-minute movie. It's worth a watch, just so you could say you've seen it. It's a hell of a lot better than Rubber, which just sucks all across the board. But... I think they could have done better with the script. Just not trying to focus on one of those messages, not on all of them. Because instead you get a completely schizophrenic movie like that. Still entertaining. But this was a recommendation from Ryan. Actually, both of these were. One was sent to me by him, and this one was recommended. Uh, the Perfect Score. A uh, little fun little early 2000s caper movie. Very, very young uh, Chris uh, oh, Evans. I don't know why I'm blanking on that. Very young Chris Evans in this. Uh, it's very fun. You know, th the acting is not very good. The heist itself is pretty slow, and it's actually the weakest part of the movie, strangely enough, is the heist. But as an early 2000s little caper movie, kids trying to steal the SAT scores, <laughs> like, you know, you get, I think it could have been a lot better. They, they could have made it more engaging. And the, the characters, some of them, like there's this Asian character. He's funny. He was making me laugh, but he was so overdone. and <laughs> but Not a bad movie, though. Like, it was a fun little early caper. And then this doesn't, I had never seen this in full before, which is why Ryan sent it to me, but now I have. Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. I don't think this one needs much introduction. Who doesn't love this one? I mean, finally, I'm glad I could say I finally sat down to watch it, you know, get to learn more about Jack Skellington and everything that happened, and now I understand more about the clothing that all the uh, post-punk and emo people in my high school wore, because you always see that plastered on everything. But yeah, no, back when Tim Burton was doing stuff like this, before Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Alice in Wonderland. Now talk about strange shit. Then we've got Charms, a.k.a. Grassland, a.k.a. Hex, a.k.a. The Shrieking. Yeah, this is released under a bunch of different titles. I got this because you guys know every update. I show a different Gary Busey movie. I collect Gary Busey movies. Every update, I have a different Gary Busey movie to show. So this was my Gary Busey movie of this selection. Also with Keith Carradine, Gary Busey, Dan Haggerty, Scott Glenn. Um, this is a movie that is seven different genres all in one. 
first of all, the music score is the most dopey, cartoonish, silly musical score I've ever seen. It's made to sound like a horror movie. This is not a horror movie in the slightest. It goes from occult horror to western to action to comedy to parody to farce to spoof to romance to action to psychedelic. There's a lot. This thing changes genre every two seconds. It's got an ending that makes no sense on purpose. It's so out there, weird, and just bonkers. It's the most schizophrenic movie I think I've ever watched. And for that, I kind of dug it, just because it was such a weird one. Like, guys, if I'm not digging the barrel of obscurities with this, then I don't know what I am. But, I mean... When I have stuff like this, I don't know what's up there, but if you love your early 70s gritty movies, this one's a blast. If you can handle the fact that it's a comedy, a horror, an action, a psychedelic, a romance, a western, a drama, it's literally everything at the same time. It is one of the strangest things I've ever watched. But good to see early Gary Busey in there. Idle Hands, another Seth Green movie. Uh, this is the most 2000, or, uh, 1999 thing you could ever watch. It's very silly, it's very hokey, but it's a perfect early 2000s teen Halloween movie about the guy's hand going haywire, and there's zombies for seemingly no reason whatsoever. It's got a finale that takes place in a school, which I always like, and funny ending. Yeah. You guys know what you're getting with this. Idle hands. I don't think that one needs too much. This was a... Now, this is kind of a funny story. I got this on eBay. I was browsing around on eBay, because I like a good documentary, if it's a topic that I can get behind. And I was going through just random items on eBay, and I uh, saw this. It was only $2 fitting, but I saw it. I'm like, huh. That's so random and obscure. That might be an interesting documentary. So I bought it on a blind whim. It's this documentary all about the $2 bill. It's called the $2 bill documentary. And uh, I did not realize when I ordered this, but when I ordered it, I took this out of the envelope when it came, and this letter came out with it. It's like, what's this? So I opened there. It turns out I bought it from the guy who made it, the narrator, host, the director, this guy's passion project. Apparently he's the one <laughs> that I bought this from. And then I checked the eBay store, and sure enough, it was. So he sent this thank you, sign thank you letter. So I will uh, be sure to leave him a, some very good feedback in, in that regard, because that's actually pretty nuts that I bought it from the director. This is actually a really well-done documentary, because when I saw that premise, I was like, a documentary all about the $2 bill. That sounds very interesting, and, you know, I'm guilty of stuff like that, because... You know, my grandpa gave me some of these, and as I learned with some of the, as I learned in the documentary, not all $2 bills are valuable. If it's a Federal Reserve note like this, it's worth $2. But if it's a United States printed note before 1976, this one's actually kind of valuable. And then I got this one from the bank. I don't know, it, it's got Santa Claus on it. I don't know, so you yeah, and. I've got a Sacagawea dollar in there, too. I've got a bunch of 50-cent pieces and dollar coins over there, too. But about the documentary itself, though, really strong documentary, you know, despite all of my $2 bills that I have saved. Like, I learned I'm a dumbass for doing that because this movie teaches you you shouldn't be doing that. But, oops. It gets surprisingly emotional places too like there's a people are telling their stories about their experiences with the two dollar bill like some of them are funny like a guy who got arrested from best buy for trying to use one to a guy who goes to concerts and gives them to the bands but then you have a woman who like the guy that was reunited with his two dollar bill from so long ago and there's a 9-11 story that's absolutely heartbreaking and the over, it has a really sweet ending, a really sweet narrative about the, the guy who made this and his son. And it was a very captivating, sweet documentary that held my interest the entire time. And the topic as random as the $2 bill, you know, 
I learned a lot watching this. You know, there's some U.S. history in there. It's how the Federal Reserve works, the U.S. Mint. Honestly, I checked this one out. Like, I, I really liked it. It was a really well done documentary. It's emotional. It's interesting. It keeps you into it. Yeah. So the director did a wonderful job. Maybe I'll send him the link to this video on eBay see if he likes it. This was a freebie I got. Uh, the Best of Trading Spaces from 2002-2003. My mom used to watch this show all the time. So I figured, well, it's free. This would be a nice little stroll down memory lane. It's not full episodes. It's just kind of clips and segments and montages or like highlights of each of the cast members. I mean, Ty Pennington, he's the best part of this. I could watch a whole box set of just him doing stuff. I always enjoyed him on this. I always loved him on Extreme Makeover Home Edition. He's just a very entertaining guy to watch, Ty Pennington. And, you know, he has some hilarious moments on this, but everyone does. You know, this group of people on this original incarnation of Trading Spaces, great chemistry. It was a funny show. I miss these kinds of shows. Like, I'll have to see if they've got any more episodes of this out there, because I'd like to see it. So that brought me back to my childhood. And last but not least, I started watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, seasons one and two, hilarious stuff. I did not even realize not only is this show still going, this just got renewed for another four seasons through season 18. So I got a long way to go on my It's Always Sunny <laughs> train, but no, the first two seasons here, this was fun. Right from the get-go, you could tell they had something with it. Danny DeVito joins in the second season. And it's fun stuff. It's dark humor, but it's played really straightforward. It's got a real kind of Larry David vibe to it with the way the humor is. And it, uh, some of it's a bit raunchy. And One of my favorite episodes on here was the boxing one just because it had such a pitch black ending, but it made it really funny. And yeah, I you're, every update from here on out, you're probably going to see me talking about a different season of this show because I look forward to continuing on with it. I'm very late to the party, but I'm glad I'm getting there, you know, better late than ever. All right, guys, November 14th. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. This is probably the weirdest assortment. It seems like every update, I always outdo myself with the weirdness that I talk about. Thank you guys for watching. Plenty of new videos coming soon, so hope you're all doing well. Yep, talk to you soon.